Okay, uh, my name is Matt Veach. I am the state archivist here at the Kansas Historical Society. Um, I have been working with um, digital preservation and electronic records management issues uh, for as long as I can remember. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things that um, I've given lots of different talks on this to different audiences. I've never been very good at this audience. Um, I, I usually deal with um, folks who are managing electronic records in email systems or in document management systems or who are creating um, trusted digital repositories that are compliant with the OAIS reference model. And we're not going to talk about any of that stuff today. Um, and so I'm, this, the, the talk I'm going to give today is actually a, a talk that um, has been kind of modified from a presentation that a colleague of mine gave on preserving your personal digital collections. And so you'll see a little bit of that kind of mixed in with some of the, the things that are more organizational. But it's, um, it's an effort to, to keep it at a, at a real, you know, pr fairly basic level and give, and give really kind of common sense um, advice that would apply to your home photos as well as the photos in your collection. All right, we'll start by, well, I wanted to start actually um, by just getting a, a sense of, of where you guys are at in terms of so like in terms of digitizing collections in term and then in terms of collecting born digital materials so who who here is is uh, has been in the habit or of for the last few years actually scanning or digitizing legacy materials okay all right so a good chunk of you are and of those of you who are doing that are you are you delivering it uh, on a website somewhere so some of you are okay um, just a, a plug for that Omeka product, uh, O-M-E-K-A. Um, I think you mentioned it. Um, we don't use it here. I kind of wish we did, but it's, it's really, really great for smaller institutions. Uh, Omeka.net is, is probably the one if you're a smaller institution and you don't have your own uh, in-house IT staff that's familiar with the LAMP stack. And if you don't know what the LAMP stack means, then, then stay away from it. Um, that means what? Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. That's what LAMP stands for. And if you don't know how to deal with those things, which I don't, but I have people who do, then don't, don't do the Omeka.org version. Do the Omeka.net, which is a hosted version of it. And it's really nice, basic presentation software for digital collections. You know, and it's, it's nothing fancy, but if you've got a collection of photographs or you have a collection, a manuscript collection that you've digitized and you want to put it up on the web and make it available to, to people around the world, uh, Omeka.net is a great place to do that. So I'll, I'll plug for them. It's developed by the uh, Center for History and New Media at, the, at George Mason University, and uh, the Center for History and New Media is a really, really fabulous organization. So if you're, if you're interested in the digital humanities, if you're interested in, in making historical materials available in, uh, in, in the new, you know, kind of the new digital uh, environment, they're, a, they're an organization to keep an eye on. <coughs> this is why I went second, because I talked too long. So. Um, I will, I will do my best. There's a timer on my new device here, but I'm not going to use it. Um, all right. So who, who here is um, actually collecting born digital materials? Oral, Oral histories that are digital, OK. Um, and what are you collecting? Are you right there? Same thing, oral histories. Who, OK, Pho digital photographs, OK. Digital photographs. I'm sorry, digital photographs as well. How about video? Some video, digital video. You're doing your oral, oral histories on digital video. Okay. Who is going after um, web content that relates to your communities? Hmm? Um, people, people. I um, mean, increasingly are are uh, they. They put things on the web, whether it's their own website, whether it's a blog, whether it's a Facebook page, whether it's Twitter, um, Pinterest, whatever it might be. Those are the things that are documenting our communities today. Is, is, is anybody uh, thinking about that? Facebook? For your own institution. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm talking about other people's, you know, because right now you in your, and, and I'm just being, you know, consciously provocative. I do this for fun, I guess, but, um, but I mean, the, most of the, of the stuff that's being produced today, most of the information about our culture is, di is being created digitally. And yes. Yeah, that's great. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking, that's a, yeah. That's, that is exactly what I'm talking about, that type of thing. And you, know, you just have to be creative about it. And there, you, know, you can do it in that um, kind of grabbing things one at a time, or you can go so far as to, we're gonna set up a crawler and we're gonna crawl a bunch of, of websites that we know are of interest to our community and we're gonna archive all the entire websites. So I'll talk about a lot of these different things. Go ahead, Pat. Who are, who are our local government people here? Okay, so so you, I assume you, you're creating digital records, electronic records, in your in the course of business. Have you have you made the shift so that you view those electronic records as the record copy, and you don't have paper? The court is going to e-filing. Yes, I'm familiar with that, and I've had some conversations with uh, with the court about that. At the, at the Supreme Court level, for example, uh, we there at the appellate court level. Uh, we have traditionally here at this, uh, in the state archives, we've received uh, paper files of every court case that the Supreme Court has ever heard going back to 1861. And, and uh, in 2010, they stopped producing paper versions of those. So now we have to figure out how are we going to preserve the electronic ones. Okay, so the point here is that our, col our collections, uh, in my view, uh, and I don't think I'm unique, are going to change. I mean, this is your this is you know your collection 50 years ago. It's probably your collection today, and this is what your collection's going to going to look like. And if it doesn't, then you probably won't exist. Um, you know, you you won't you won't be relevant. You won't be doing. You won't be fulfilling your responsibilities as as institutions that document the history and the culture of of our. Uh, particular society. And so that's, as the state archivist uh, and as the state historical society, we take this, this issue very seriously. It's a legacy issue for us. We don't want to be in a position to uh, have this giant documentation gap during an era when uh, we've had an information uh, or documentation explosion. I mean, it's this real catch-22. It's, but it's really, really hard, and it's really, it's something that we cannot ignore uh, but there are no easy answers. So we're creating just ridiculous amounts of information. Uh, Eric Schmidt, anybody know Eric Schmidt? Google guy, you know, former CEO of Google. Uh, he, he made a statement back in 2010 claiming that every, what is it, every, I better look at my notes or I might misstate something here. Um, he says that every two days, and I don't know if, if this is absolutely precise, but every two days we create as much information as had been created from the, from the beginning of recorded history to 2003. All right, so that is just it's just it's just insane the amount of, of information that's being created in digital form. So it's it's a, it's a challenging challenging issue. So I'm just, like I said, I'm going to try to provide you with a, with a high-level overview, a framework, basically, for thinking about uh, your digital content, both the stuff that you already have and the stuff that you, that you may go after. I'm not going to give you any quick fixes because there aren't any. Uh, a few tips, strategies, tools, technologies that might be helpful. But we're going to start a little bit by just talking about what's hard about digital preservation. All right, you know, Jocelyn was up here and, you know, she was confusing me with all of that PPI stuff, you know, it's like, wh whatever, you know, just, I'll just use the chart. I mean, it's, it's, it's confusing. Digital preservation is even harder than that. Oh, yes. Thank you, Pat. This is my, this is my box. Okay. So this, this is old in in our traditional view of the world all right this is this is samuel reader's diary from 1855 um, june of 1855 it's an image from uh, from kansas memory item number 90315 for those of you scoring at home and you uh you know obviously it's handwritten it's on a piece of paper it's been digitized but we can read it and it was created in 1855 this is old in, in digital terms, right? That's a CD. 
and CDs um, are about 30 years old. That's a very, very long time, very long time in digital years. All right, so the point here is that <coughs> the stuff, um, we laugh, you know, but there are big differences between these two objects, between these two items. The one on the left, we can read with the naked eye. We're not dependent on a piece of hardware. We're not dependent on, on a software program to interpret information that's on the, the CD. So in digital form, the content itself, what you're trying to deliver to someone is, is completely separate from the representation. So in, in this case, the words on the paper and the paper itself are one in the same thing. And as long as we store that well, using all of the techniques that we learned about uh, earlier this morning, that's going to be around for many, many years. And we are not going to, we really don't have to do anything to it other than store it well. Benign, neg benign neglect works well with traditional analog materials. You cannot do that. Benign neglect is a recipe for absolute disaster when it comes to digital materials. For, the, for this very reason, all right, if we were relying on laser discs as our primary storage mechanism or media for important information, and we didn't do anything to make sure that we had, when, when this technology was obsolete, to move it to the new generation of technology, we would be out of luck. All right? It would be very, very difficult, if not impossible, to get the information off there. So you have to be ever vigilant. We're gonna go over, um, we're just gonna keep, keep this pretty simple. We're gonna talk about five different things to think about when you're, when you're planning and, and thinking through preserving your digital collections. And it just breaks down to identifying what you have, where it is, making hard choices sometimes about what you really need to keep. And that's no different than in a paper environment too. It's appraisal. You need to organize that content. Again, very similar to what you, what you deal with in a, in a paper environment. You need to distribute copies for safekeeping. Jocelyn's already alluded to that. And then what I was just talking about, you need to, you need to replace and, and upgrade or update the storage media and maybe even the software, the file formats themselves. All right, so you start out by identifying what you already have. And that can be, uh, depending on, on what you've been doing over the years, that can actually be pretty challenging. You know, if you think about your own personal computer you know, and, and you know, do, how often do you go back and look at all the files you've created? Do you even know where they all, you know, reside? Some people are really good at this. You know, some people are really diligent. You know, they're the people that have clean houses and, cl and clean kitchens and all of that. They also have clean hard drives, but, uh, but some people aren't. So there are times when you just need to assess what you, what you have, you know, whether that's on a, on a personal computer in, in the office, whether you store things in Dropbox, in the cloud, or SkyDrive, or whether you store them on CDs and put them back in the stack somewhere, whether you still have punch cards, you know, whatever it might be. And then I, I threw this question in there again. I've, we've already talked about this, but I do want you to come away. Now, this isn't just digital preservation. This is a bit of a call to action for, uh, you know, what should you have in your collections that's digital? I mean, you know, many of us came to this, to this work that we're doing, whether it's library work or archives work, or museum work, or even uh, local government records work, because we really like, um, we like the stuff. You know, we like, we like three-dimensional objects. We like paper. We like books. Um, but, but it's no longer acceptable for us to just focus all of our attention on that. We have to pay attention to how our, our society is evolving. So think about what you should have. So if people are putting up photographs on Facebook pages that are, are the kinds of things that if they came into your door, came through your doors uh, in paper form, you would, you would be very excited to have them, then think about how can I get those, how can I get those photos into my collection? It's like, like I could do over there. And then finally, where, where is the stuff, the digital stuff? Like I said, it can, it can be a lot of different places. I mean, maybe it's on your phone. 
you know, I got a lot of stuff on this iPad that, that you know, maybe it doesn't exist somewhere else. So, so keep, you know, this proliferation, this kind of, kind of distribution of digital materials, it's really, really easy to spread it all around. All right, and then you need to think about what, what needs to be kept. Yes, ma'am? Depends on what, the, what it is. I mean, um, if it's, the, the question is, okay, so you've, you've, you've figured out what you have, maybe what you should have and where it's located. Great, what does that do for you? What do you where do you go from there, all right? Well, for, one thing that you do is you try to figure out, do you need all of it? All right, is all of that information, that all that digital information, and you know, again, this is a hard presentation to give because I'm, I'm talking about stuff that you, you know, just, that you just generate in the course of business. I'm talking about materials that you're collecting. I'm talking about materials that you've digitized. And then I'm also trying to throw in that stuff that you should be collecting. But let's, let's stick with, it's, it's, it's either born digital material that you've collected or it's materials that you have digitized. All right, and you know, if you've done a good job with both of those things, then the answers to these questions aren't hard, all right? You, you know where everything is, and you, you pretty much know what it is. But there could be instances where someone before you engaged in a project to digitize material, and maybe they didn't have the best file naming conventions, and maybe they weren't so good at creating folders, and you know, you, you may just have to do kind of an inventory. So what what do I have? And then what what should I keep? I mean, let's take digitized content. All right. So we talked earlier about TIFF files, the master images, you know, the master TIFFs. And then you've got JPEGs that are probably your your use copies, the ones you're going to deliver. You know, lower resolution uh, JPEGs that you'll deliver online. Well, you could have a proliferation of those. You know, maybe you've maybe you've got uh, JPEGs of the same thing uh, in five or six different locations. So maybe you can get rid of some of them. Maybe you've decided, like we have at the Historical Society, and Jocelyn um, didn't go into this, but it's, um, or maybe you did, and I was thinking about something else. Um, but with our master TIFFs, we've we've got a lot of master TIFFs. We've got 15, 16 terabytes of master TIFF files. And we're, and we're generating somewhere in the neighborhood of five to eight terabytes of new master TIFF files every year because of this ability to use digital SLRs and do things really fast. And, and I'm also the IT director here at the Historical Society, so I'm responsible for making sure we have enough storage for all of this stuff. And Jocelyn and her, and her people are driving me crazy. It's like, slow down. There's too much stuff. You're creating too much. We can't buy that much storage fast enough. It's a great problem to have. They're very, very productive, and, and so we're getting more and more materials out there. But we have made a decision that those master TIFFs on certain types of textual materials contain more data, more information than we really think we need to preserve. And, and so that we are going to actually rely on the, the, a, a high-resolution JPEG, a compressed image, for some of those materials. Yeah, it's sacrilege. Yeah. Yeah, I can barely barely speak the words, but um, but we have made that choice that for financial reasons. Um, but it's very well, con you know, very carefully considered. We won't do that with photographs. We won't do that with anything that's graphical. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, Jocelyn, you'll probably have to help me out with this. Wh which uh, which of the images are we going to save JPEGs only? State publications. Some manuscript materials. Any, anything that's graphical in nature will always remain a TIFF. Um, and those, of, I don't know, for, for those of you who don't know the difference, a TIFF image is uncompressed. And so every little piece of, of information that has been recorded by either the camera or the scanner is retained in the image. And so it can be as much as 95% bigger than a JPEG. And so on a JPEG where all we want to be able to do is, is display in a, and render in a legible form words, typed written, particularly typewritten words, it just seemed um, almost irresponsible for us to use that much storage space um, for, those, for those images. Yes, Pat? 
that's true. Yeah, state yeah state publications are stored multiple places, but um, but I think it mostly comes down to um, you know we're not doing this for preservation purposes. You know we're we're not destroying original manuscript materials after we've scanned them. So we still have the original manuscript items, still have the original letter. So uh, what it, what what are we risking? Well, we're risking the, f the 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 risk is we may have to scan that. The possibility exists that we could have to scan that at some later date at a, at, at a higher resolution because somebody wanted to blow it up to wall size. All right, that's the risk. And so I don't, you know, it's risk management, and that's what we've we've chosen to do. It, it you know, we all we have all had you know our, a little bit of heartburn over it, and we haven't fully implemented it. We're still talking about it, but. Uh, but I think we're down. We're going down the path. Digital photos are another example of you know the what is important to you. You know the appraisal part of all of this. If you think of, again, you kind of bring it back to your own personal experience with digital photographs, and you know you take that camera with you on vacation, and you go to Barcelona, and you know and you're looking at a Gaudi, um, you know a, some Gaudi architecture, and if if ten images are good then 500 is better, you know? That's my approach. Yeah. I went to China with Pat a few years back and we came back, would we come back with 5,000 images, I think, between, you know, three or four different cameras? Um, and, you know, we, we keep thinking, boy, we should go in and weed those, you know? We should make decisions on those. But that's a painful process and most people don't do it. Some people do, but most people don't. And so the digital photographs that you're going to get in your collections are going to come from people like that, you know, just average folk who are out there, you know, th they don't have 36 exposures on a roll of film. They've got 5,000 that they can put on their 16 gigabyte, um, whatever those things are called, compact flash cards, right? So you may end up, you know, we may end up with this situation, you know, do we have to, do we need to go in and, and weed some of that material? You know, those are hard choices, you know, and then that takes time but you may not need 15 images of the same thing, you know, with slight variations. All right, so we've, we've identified what we have. We've made some selections. Uh, we, th we then need to organize this stuff, and hopefully we've already been doing this. You know, again, th these are things, these aren't necessarily in, in, you know, a specific order, but organizing and documenting, providing context for the digital material is something that most of us don't like very much. Although, you know, maybe we don't dislike it so much. This, this most people hate this part is, is usually for a more general audience. You know, you guys have self-selected. So you've all got kind of a, you know, an OCD kind of element to your approach to life. So maybe you don't hate it. But uh, again, this is really basic stuff. This isn't, we're not gonna go into Dublin Core or any of the, you know, we're not going into metadata standards here. I've tried that before and that doesn't, that, I'm, that's not what we're doing here in, in 45 minutes. Um, as, as Jocelyn indicated, some kind of file naming convention uh, is essential, um, particularly if you're doing your own digitization, but maybe even when you're bringing things into your collection. So here's, a, here's an example. This isn't, this isn't my example. This is my friend Marty. And my friend Marty um, was our electronic records archivist here for seven months. And then he found a better job in Seattle. And um, I'm very sad about that. But he left me this wonderful image of, of a chicken fried steak that, they, that it was called at a restaurant called, and they called it Bigfoot the Legend was the name of this chicken fried steak. And he, he, he liked it so much. I'm vegetarian, so I would never order this. But it still looks good to me. I used to get this, this kind of stuff years ago. But he was, he, he was so enamored of this chicken fried steak that he took, it, he took a, a, a photo of it with his cell phone. And that's the, the name. That's the file name that the cell phone assigned. And that doesn't tell you very much. Um, you know, database management system that's going to keep track of everything for you. Maybe you do something at the file naming level that conveys information. All right, so maybe you do something. This is very similar, actually, to the way I name files. Yeah, usually, you know, a little some keywords and then a date. 
that's kind of how I, I would I've normally done it and, and I've learned the hard way over over the years um, working in in the place where I work I'm like many of you you're, pr you're you probably like hierarchy you know you, you like to break things down taxonomically and start at the highest level and work down about eight levels and I've always enjoyed that with you know like in Windows Explorer you know it's you start at, at, a, at a very high level and, and in your path becomes so long you can hardly even describe it as you as you go down levels of aggregation and that's great as long as you've got that file system that goes with the file but if you get down to if you've, you've put this file in something called you know travel uh, Seattle 2010 food fried food <laughs> all right Image zero two four zero. Now, in the in that file structure, in that hierarchical file structure, that makes sense, right? You've contextualized it. But then you then you decide that you need to send that image somewhere else to someone else or to another system. Well, you may or may not get to take that file file structure with it, and so all you get is image zero two four zero. And I've learned that over time because I've shared a lot of documents with people around the state, so. I've learned that it's very good to have a self-describing file name. Sometimes I'd get a little bit like this. So you can take it to, to an extreme, but in general, something along those lines is, is a good practice. There are other, other ways that you can, we've talked a little bit about tagging files or, or adding, um, maybe adding you know, keywords to them or subject headings to them. There are lots of different ways and lots of different systems that you can use to add these terms. But something, somebody asked something important earlier uh, when Jocelyn was speaking about whether certain pieces of metadata were embedded in the file, embedded in the TIFF or embedded in the JPEG, or whether they were stored as metadata outside of that file. Now here, here at the Historical Society, you know, we're pretty committed to, our, to our, um, our metadata that resides outside of the file itself. And so we don't feel the need to, uh, at this point, to embed a lot of descriptive metadata inside the file. But there are, there, are, there are times, particularly in your own personal life, where tagging things using some third party software can just cause you all kinds of pain and suffering. I mean, I've experienced this myself with my digital photographs that I've uploaded to like third party hosted sites, you know, like a Flickr or a, or a Picasa, something like that and you add tags, and then you decide, oh, I don't really like Flickr anymore, or I don't like Picasa anymore. It's very, very hard to pull those tags with you. Now, there are ways to do it, but you are always running the risk. You know, if you've added, added 30 tags to a photograph, identifying all of the different people and the different flowers and, you know, whatever it might be, and it's very disappointing to have done that and then realize that when you want to when you want to move to a new service or you want to download that to your own your own PC for safekeeping, that those tags don't necessarily come with it. All right, so it gets kind of technical, but there are ways when you're dealing with your with photographs. To, there there are pieces of software out there that actually allow you to tag individual files and have those tags become part of the file. I was doing some research on this, um, I guess as part of preparing for this presentation, because I was just curious. There's the, there's the metadata that, uh, that the camera generates, right? It's EXIF metadata, E-X-I-F metadata. A lot of stuff about what kind of camera was it, you know, and, and a whole bunch of administrative metadata. But there's also some other, there are some more descriptive metadata standards, XMP being one of the more common ones, um, that where you can actually add descriptive metadata, a, a title, some keywords, dates, geolocations, things like that. You can add that to an individual image um, and have it be just part of the JPEG file or part of the TIFF file. Yes? Yeah, if, if you've got that feature turned on, yes. Yes, it, it's a geocode, geolocation code. And, for, and some people, um, that's what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. If you don't want that, to, yeah, or if, if that's, I mean, for a lot of people, I want to know where I took the photograph, so I want that geocode. But if you're concerned about a privacy issue, then yes, you can turn it off.
but it's inside the file. And so there are some real advantages to having that information embedded in the file itself. Yes? Right, right. Now I understand, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm walking a fine line between general advice for average people and what's the best practice in the library world, you know? We, we're not going, you know, uh, we, we do way too much to actually go, you know, to, we, we scan too many images to go in there and kind of put in tags on each individual image. Now we could do that programmatically, you know, we could do that systematically and at some point that may become best practice, but you're right, there is no direct lineup. Dublin Core, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, 15 basic elements, um, you know, ways of describing material, you know, digital material. Yes, ma'am. Yes, it's very common. I mean, it's not a, you know, it, it's just one of those, uh, you know, it's a fairly, I mean, geolocation is just so much a part of our lives now. I mean, when, you, when you're using your iPhone or you're using your Android phone or you're using your iPad or you're using your Android tablet uh, or you're using your computer, I mean, if you think about Google search today, it's very different than it was 10 years ago or however long Google's been around. It's tailored specifically to your location. It knows where you are, you know. And if you're using your computer, it knows, for, based on your IP address, it knows pretty much where you are. It may not be able to pin you down to a five meter radius, but it knows which zip code you're in. So it can tailor search results to you. So yeah, it, it's certainly happening and it's happening ubiquitous, ubiquitously. Uh, this is a slide that Marty included that's uh, interesting. I don't know, most of you probably never do this, but you can actually, there's all kinds of embedded metadata that you can add to a, a Word doc. All kinds of properties. So you can right click on a Word doc and say properties and a lot of this stuff will show up for you. Very few people actually use this, but if they did, uh, these documents would be much more discoverable over time. Is it? Metadata in a... In a, in a Oh, he didn't know, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then again, this archive folder concept when we're organizing, it's, it's more of, a, of, of an artifact of talking to a general audience, but it can apply in a lot of different settings. We struggle with, the, with this concept here at the Historical Society. This is the idea that, that in somewhere in your file system on the, for the stuff that you really wanna save, that's really important to you, you pull it into an archive folder and maybe have some subfolders there. An example here at the Historical Society is we have, a, we have a shared drive for images that are more promotional in nature or kind of temporary in nature. Uh, we call it the O drive. And it's the bane of our existence because it's a dumping ground for any and every image or video that, you're, that you've created Quick, quickly in performing one of your jobs here at the Historical Society, and it's at a, it's about two terabytes and growing, and it, nothing ever goes out of it. No, nothing ever gets deleted. All right, and so we've got to solve it. And so we're thinking about something as simple as an archive folder on the O drive, so that if you really want to keep it, you drag it in there, and probably in some subfolder, and then everything else gets deleted at a certain point. All right, now some basic preservation concepts, and and. Um, Jocelyn's already alluded to some of these things. Distributing your collection. So di distributing your digital collection. Anybody recognize that acronym? Maybe you know what that stands for? Lots of copies keep stuff safe. And I'm not talking, I, you know, that's a piece of software uh, that's very, you know, very uh, widely used for distributing multiple copies of digital um, digital materials across multiple, multiple servers. I'm using it more in terms of a concept that you protect yourself and, and because of the ease with which you can, you can replicate digital materials, you can have much greater protection for your collections than you can in a paper environment where it's much more difficult in, to create multiple copies. So a simple, a simple rule. Marty calls it the three, two, one rule. Um, three copies, and these are for things that really matter to you, all right? We've already, we've already identified and we've selected and we've done some organization, all right? This isn't for just every old file that's sitting out there. This is the important stuff. Three copies of it, two of them on different storage media, all right? So it, it's, it really doesn't do you very much good to have three copies on one hard drive, 
all right? That just, that's just not, you know, because that hard drive crashes, obviously you're going to lose all three copies. So that's, that's kind of silly. So you'd have one copy, say, on a, on a local hard drive, one copy uh, on a CD or a DVD or an external hard drive or in a Dropbox account. And then ideally, you have one copy in a different physical location. All right, so you've got one copy on the local PC, one copy on a flash drive that's, that's uh, sitting at work, and another copy on a flash drive that you take home or that you put at a different location in, uh, you know, in your city or your town. Or increasingly, what people are doing is they're using the cloud as that external, you know, off-site location. And we're, we're looking at that very seriously for uh, the, the 15, 16 terabytes of images that I talked about. You know, we're exploring the possible use of something called Amazon Glacier. Great name. It's a, it's a very low-cost cloud storage service that Amazon is offering. And so we've calculated that for somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, a couple thousand dollars a year, we can store all of that information. It's not very accessible. Right? Yeah, it, it would be very hard to get it out. It would cost us money to get it out, but that's kind of our disaster recovery copy. If something should go terribly awry here at the Historical Society or here or at our offsite data center in Wichita, um, then we would have that third copy in a, in a different location. Okay, so three, two, one. Three copies, two different storage media, one in an offsite location. And then finally, um, this concept of uh, there is no such thing as benign neglect when it comes to digital materials. You need to check those files, not every single one of them, but at least at least a sampling of those of those files regularly to make sure that you can still access them. And uh, and again, ideally, you're going to refresh your storage media every few years. So if you've got things, particularly if you're storing things on um, something that is just going to sit on a shelf, whether that's an external drive, whether that's a flash drive, or whether that's a CD or a DVD. You know, if those things have been sitting there for more than a two or three years, you're running great risk. Right? So you need to check and make sure you can still access it. I mean, that, that's just, it's just going to degrade by sitting there on the, on the, on the shelf. So you need to, to make sure you can still access it. And ideally, every, every two or three years, probably every three years, if you're storing it externally like that, you're going to move it to either another CD or another DVD or another flash drive or another external drive or whatever the, the storage medium of choice might be. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that, that we get questions about a lot. Uh, CD and DVD manufacturers often will uh, market their materials as archival quality. Uh, it, there's no such thing. All right. Absolutely no such thing. They claim that there's a hundred year um, shelf life. They've just done some, some kind of simulations. Don't trust it. That last bullet there, pay attention to new and updated software. It might it probably should also say pay attention to new and updated file formats. Now most of us are using file formats that have been around a long time and will, 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 will remain around a long time. Uh, but pay attention. So if you're hearing that the Historical Society has decided to move from TIFF to JPEG for certain of its images, you might, you might ask us why we did that. Or if you hear that the Historical Society is moving from TIFF to something you've never heard of, um, you, might, you might ask about that too. Be aware of the environment because things do change. It's more stable than it was 15 years ago when I first got into this business. Um, but it, it's, still, um, it's still volatile. All right, so just to summarize, identify, select, organize, distribute, and schedule. Those are the concepts. Um, it, oh, you should have, um, and we do, I do a lot of uh, do as I say, not as I do kind of things. Uh, you should have a digital preservation policy that articulates some of these things. And we've got some of these things, some of them are in policy, but not all of them here at the Historical Society because things, things do change fast and uh, we're trying to get things you know, digitized rather than write policies. 
but it's something that, that Pat and, and, and myself and Jocelyn and her, her supervisor have been talking about the need to get down on paper. What is our policy? What are our strategies? All right, and just, I know I, have, I don't have any more time, but I'm just gonna quickly go through a couple of, of things related to archiving in the web. I kind of alluded to that at the beginning of my talk. Um, just again, I'm not gonna spend any time on it, but there are um, tools out there for archiving web content. And if you're not familiar with the Internet Archive, anybody here not familiar with the Internet Archive? A few of you. Okay, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with it or if you don't spend much time there, it is one awesome place, archive.org. And, and it's been around since 1996. A guy named Brewster Kale made a bet, bunch of money in the dot com boom in the early 90s, early to mid 90s, decided he was going to archive the entire internet. And everybody thought he was nuts. And he's still around and he still does, um, he, he and his, his group are doing just amazing things. And so they have, they have archived, they go out and they just crawl the web. In any websites that don't block them, specifically block them, they just go out periodically and they just suck down everything they can and then they put it up on this archive.org website. So if you want to, if you want to see what the K, you know, Kansas State Historical Society website looked like in 1998, you can go look at it. It's ugly, but you can look at it. Uh, archive it. Um, I've been trying to, you know, Pat, Pat and I have been talking about Archive It for a while. Really like us to, to maybe participate in this particular initiative. And what Archive It is, is it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an internet archive service where you as an institution subscribe. So it's not free, but you get a set of tools that allow you to take advantage of all of their wonderful software. But you get to pick and choose the websites that you want to crawl and harvest and how frequently do you want to do it, and how deep do you want to go, and how many links do you want to follow. You can add metadata to it, and they've got a very nice presentation, public, public presentation, um, public access side to it. All right, it's pretty cool. And then Archive Social, uh, I just throw that up there uh, because uh, that's kind of, the, kind of one of the new things coming down the pike, and I think it's Archive Social, not Archive Social, my, my mistake. Um, it is a, a really nice tool for uh, archiving Twitter and Facebook in particular. And it, it's being used uh, particularly in some state government environments where we want to be able to archive you know, the governor's Facebook page. Um, and so it, it does a really nice job of, of pulling the content down and then presenting it in a very intelligible way um, to end users but you get a set of tools that allow you to take advantage of all of their wonderful software. But you get to pick and choose the websites that you want to crawl and harvest and how frequently do you want to do it and how deep do you want to go and how many links do you want to follow. You can add metadata to it and they've got a very nice presentation, public, public presentation, um, public access side to it. All right, it's pretty cool. And then Archive Social, uh, I just throw that up there uh, because uh, that's kind of the kind of one of the new things coming down the pike. And I think it's Archive Social, not Archive Social. My my mistake. Um, it is a a really nice tool for uh, archiving Twitter and Facebook in particular. And it, it's being used uh, particularly in some state government environments where we want to be able to archive, you know, the governor's Facebook page. Um, and so it, it does a really nice job of of pulling the content down and then presenting it in a very intelligible way um, to end users. All right, and then you get into issues of uh, the actual, when you're actually using Facebook and Twitter and other things yourself, and how you archive those materials your, yourself or for your um, people who may want to donate to you. So say you have a donor come in and they say, well, you know, I'm, I've been doing all this stuff on Facebook and I think that, that, you know, that's really the best documentation of my life and I want to donate that to the, your, you know, the, the local historical society. Um, how would you do that? Well, I'm, 
going to skip some of this, but you the, probably the, the you know the only real good way of doing that right now. I don't know. Has, has anybody ever seen this page on Facebook? Have you? Really? Yeah. It, I, I was able to successfully do it, but it's not that useful. I mean, you you, you know it, it doesn't look like Facebook anymore, really. You know, but at least you can get your photos. Yeah. Never got it to work. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, part of the reason for even bringing this up is that it's, you know, all of these free services is kind of a caveat emptor. You know, if you're not paying for the service, if you're not paying for the commodity, then you are the commodity, right? You know, that's how it works. But some, but many of these services like Facebook are starting to at least acknowledge the fact that their users have some rights to the content and should have the opportunity to download the content. So Facebook has done that. Twitter has done that. And even Google, um, Google Takeout, they always come up with the best little terms for things. Um, you, at least some of their services, uh, you, can, uh, you can export it. But you don't see Gmail up there. All right, so Gmail, you have to do that on your own if you want to pull that down. Okay, I'm I'm basically done. Um, a lot of what I've what I've been trying to convey, you can find in much more detailed form uh, at the Library of Congress. They have a they have a really really excellent uh, website called digitalpreservation.gov. Um, just a wealth of information, constantly growing, and we use it all the time. The this slide deck basically came from. Um, you know, a variation on it came from a, a whole section of this website on uh, right in the middle there, preserving your digital, excuse me, preserving your digital memories. Very useful stuff on there. What's next? This dude on the left, um, he he's a real geek, but he um, he he wears like little cameras on his glasses and on his forehead and records his entire life. Um, and there's a name for, name for what he's doing. I, for, uh, I forget what his name is, but so that was kind of the, er, the early version. And then the, the Google Glasses um, over there on the right, um, a couple of years from now, that will be the fashion statement that we'll all want to be wearing. And then uh, that's, where we, that's where we may end up. So it's lunchtime. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to uh, to take questions during lunch or come up to me afterwards. Um, but thank you very much for your attention, and uh, enjoy your lunch. <laughs>